Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. Cost-effective, robust digital gene expression of profiling of up to 96 targets and 96 samples for cell line screening with Encounter Plexet free agents, presented by Chris Merritt, who is a senior scientist at Nanostring Technologies Incorporation. I am Marjorie Torres of Labberts, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by NanoString Technologies. For more information about our sponsor, visit www.nanostring.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom or center of your screen or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Merritt. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, again, I'm Chris Merritt. I'm a senior scientist at Nanostring and um, I'm going to talk to you about one of these uh, new assays I've been working on for several years now and is now commercial. I want to give um, an overview of Nanostring, this new technology, and where we're going with it right now. So many people on the other side may not know what um, Encounter technology is and what Nanostring does, so I'm going to give a few slides on that first. So what, what is Encounter technology? So what we do is count molecules more specifically RNA and DNA molecules. And we're a single molecule, molecule counting company. We can count up to 800 different targets per sample for one of our assays. So that's septimal sensitivity, which is in the hundreds of molecules. Um, it's, it's done, this counting is done through a simple base pairing um, hybridization technique. So it's very robust and there are no enzymes necessary. So this is going to be very different than like a qPCR type of assay. And I'll get into that further in the talk. And this ends up being pure digital data. So it's very simple. There's a lot of precision with our data. So what you end up getting are just counts or just numbers from it for each of your genes of interest. So below I have this, you know, beautiful image of uh, some of our barcodes that we use to count. I'm just going to zoom in there, give you an idea of you know, the fundamentals of our technology. Again, what we do is we count these little barcodes. And this picture here on the right show, in, in green would be an RNA target molecule. On the left, there's a little circle, which is a biotin that captures the molecule. And on the right is a reporter with um, six different circles that I actually count on. And then what we're zooming in on here is an actual image of one of these barcodes, an RNA molecule um, targeted or measured by our instrument. And then I'm going to get deeper in this technology. So the products we have right now, the instruments um, we sell that actually run these assays are shown on the left there in this little research box. So we have the MAX instrument and the Sprint, which actually read out these barcodes, like I mentioned, which I'll get into in more details. The consumables we can be a completely custom assay. So if you have 800 genes of interest, you can design probes and quantify any of those you'd like. We also sell panels for these. So a lot of um, a lot of people doing research right now see in immune, immune oncology, neurobiology, other fields end up looking at very similar sets of genes. So we sell custom or already made panels for these approximately 100 different targets. Um, we were working on other different technologies here. There's another picture of a box that says DSP. That's a different instrument. I'm not going to get into too much, but my team also works on these other things in R&D. And so on the left area of research, which I'm going to focus on, Nanostring also uses these same assays and bridges it into diagnostics. So that's shown on the right. Um, we have a pro -signa gene uh, signature assay that we currently have out in the diagnostic world. And we have other, um, other parts of R&D that, again, 
not my parts of R&D focus on those sort of assays. So definitely go on our website to look into more of that. And with all of this, we have software to help analyze the data and we have internal services to help get um, your projects off the ground so there. So what are the advantages of using this technology or our, our, our barcode counting technology? So going from left to right here, it, it ends up being simple and fast. So I come from a molecular biology background, did a lot of QPCR back in the day. You know, you, you're used to handling a lot of different samples, doing a lot of pipetting steps. This assay ends up being quite simple. Um, you mix a few tubes together, mix with your sample, shown, you know, basically a picture of a pipette here, put them in a tube, then you put them in a thermocycler overnight. Um, and that's when the actual in, uh, the actual in, um, in solution hybridization happens. And then you basically load that up on the next day on an instrument with you know, less than 30 minutes hand on, hands on time. And from that, you get these uh, precise counts for it. it. Ends up being highly multiplex. So again, in each tube, you can look up to 800 targets, like I mentioned, at a time. And then because of all this, this the data analysis is quite simple. And we already sell, we don't sell, sorry, this actually comes free the solver analysis software. And so this, like our, our normal workflow is actually quite simple, especially if you have purified RNA. What I want to focus on a little bit in here and introduce this concept of like, we have a very simple workflow, we've multiplexed it quite a lot, and actually running more than, we can run up to 96 samples at a time per run. We're also making this compatible with cell lysate, so you don't have to go completely through um, an RNA purification procedure to monitor your sample. Again, since this is, um, a it can be a completely custom assay, and we're just measuring the clay acid, so you can essentially look at any target, any species, in the middle here, I have humans, and uh, that's going to be the focus of my talk in immune oncology and looking at those genes of interest. But we can design panels or custom um, code sets against any species out there, from nematodes to humans. So, how does this work? So, again, I showed the picture of the barcode. I'm going to get into the details a little bit more now. And so, on the left here, I have a picture of a capture probe. That's what we call it. And on the left side, so we, we have a biotin molecule, and then we have a, a little stretch of nucleic acid that's about 50 base pairs long that's going to target your gene of interest, so it's complementary. And then on the barcode side, we have the next 50 bases that we target. And then what ends up happening overnight in the tube is those two complexes come together, um, hybridized with the, the nucleic acid. And once that happens overnight, basically put it on our instrument, it's going to purify this complex on both sides of the biotin side and the barcode side. It's going to be put on an imaging surface. Our instrument's going to image those little barcodes, count them, and in the end, you basically get your gene name and how many counts there were for it. So it ends up being digital information. Um, and again, here's a little picture showing those little barcodes on there. User doesn't have to look at those. I just like showing those because they're fairly beautiful images. And then you just get counts. We count those for you. And since it's nucleic acids, you can look at a lot of different things. So I'm going to focus on messenger RNAs right here, but we can also look at long, long non-coding RNAs, gene fusions. We've got microRNA assay. We can look at DNA, so we can look at single nucleotide variants, um, copy number variants. And at the bottom here, we also have protein assays. So we can actually conjugate oligos to an antibody and use that as a surrogate to measure protein. Again, the focus of this talk is going to be messenger RNAs. So that's a quick overview of what Nanostream does right now. And again, what I've been working on is this PlexSec technology and I work on an alternative to qPCR technology because it, it's very competitive with qPCR in terms of throughput, number of genes you look at, and ease of use. So on the right here, I'm just showing a 96 volt plate. And if you aren't familiar with Nanostream technology, most of the runs you would do in Nanostream, we live in this moderate, um, plex place for genes, which is about 800 typically, and we'll usually just run 12 samples times those 800 targets per run. And when, what we've done for plex is basically we're looking at higher throughput, more samples at a time, but less genes. So instead of being 800 genes, we shrunk that down to about 96 genes per sample, and you can even go less than that. And in a typical run, you'd have those 96 genes and look at 96 different samples at a time. And 96 is a number most of us are very comfortable with, working with eight times 12 sample uh, plates in those grids. So um, the advantages for this is since it's a hybridization, it ends up being enzyme-free, 
which is which is great. So I'm I'm going on the left here under efficient workflow and going down each of these check marks. So it's um, enzyme free, which makes it easier. We're working on these what we're calling nice and go protocols, so you don't have to purify your RNA to actually measure what's in your cells. In the end, there's fewer pipetting steps because of the ease of use, just the way the assay is set, is set up. And, and if you want to add more genes to the assay, so you can measure just 12 genes at a time. That's all you want to do. If you want to measure 96, you buy the oligos and reagents to actually do that. But it ends up feeling the exact same. So the workflow isn't any more if you look at more targets. Um, finally, there's a no, no RT steps, as I mentioned. So there's no enzymes involved with that. And in the end, it's it's very it's, since the data is so digital and it's not analog like qPCR, you get you can see very small full changes. And since everything's happening in one tube, you don't have to split it into hundreds of reactions. So, so that's what we've done here. I'm not going to get into the details on the tricks we played to actually get 96 samples on just one encounter run. Um, I'll save that for a different conversation. But one other thing we added to this is made this even more custom than our normal reagents. And this is gonna probably resonate with qPCR users. So what we do, so I have a target sequence here, so let's just call it CD3 that we're looking at. Um, what we end up doing or what the customer will do is buy a probe A, what we call probe A and a probe B, against the gene of interest to cover about 50 base pairs on each size of the target of interest. And again, these are designed by our bioinformatics team who know more than anyone in the world on in-solution hybridization under our conditions. And they'll design probes that are highly specific to the genes of interest for you. And then what we do is basically bridge our reporter tag and our universal capture tag on the other side using universal sequences, what I don't have to get to. So in the end, it, 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 ha it has a feel like qPCR where you're bringing in your probe A, probe Bs, or your forward and reverse oligos to actually measure your gene of interest, but you're actually not doing enzymatic amplification. These are just gonna hybridize together. So what the workflow looks like. Next slide. So from left to right, this slide, it ends up being not much hands-on time, which I mentioned about 30 minutes. That's what we usually clock people at. And I'm just going to go from left to right here. So there's a plate, a 96 volt plate. You can imagine you have all your samples in your 96 volt plate already in there. What we do for Plex sets, we have tubes on the left. You would just add in these probate Pro B's that you purchase from an OGO supplier. I put those across the plate from left to right. So those arrows that are colorful are going from left to right showing that. And basically, you take that, put a cover on it, let it hybridize overnight in a thermocycler at 67 degrees, and then you come in the next day, take the cover off the 96 volt plate, pull all the way down the different columns into a 12 volt strip tube, and then number four here on the far right says you just load, load and analyze. So you have them in the strip tubes, load them on one of our cartridges or cards that show here under load, and then the machine counts it for you automatically. So it ends up being an overnight hybridization, which is where most of the time goes, but it's actually not hands-on time. So those are the simple steps involved. And another thing I'd like to show, especially for a lot, a lot of people have a lot of experience with qPCR, so I'd like to show one other difference between us and qPCR is that each of these little wells were shown here, so I'm zooming in just on a 96 volt plate. You can put lysates in there, total purified, purified RNA in each of these wells. Like what you have in there is actually your target, but you also, instead of looking at just one gene per well in here, we actually look at all 96 genes at the same time. So in this little lysate well shown here, A1, you have your RNA targets coming out of your lysate. We have uh, positive and negative controls for our system in there. All 96 genes from those 96 will have a bunch of housekeepers we'll also look at, so more than one housekeeper typically. And then um, all the other references you need in there. So there's been a lot of stuff going on in one two, which is quite different. And again, how does this overcome some of the issues with qPCR? So I always like to show a few slides on this stuff right here. So you, know, you always start with your sample, of course, so your cells of interest, typically purify the RNA, make cDNA out of it, amplify it, and then you get your data from it. And through all this, you know, there are pipetting steps involved, which you know, can always cause error in there. You also need to, when you go from your cDNA and you're amplifying it, you start. You need to do a lot of technical replicates for qPCR, typically. Um, so that involves sample splitting per targets and having several different replicates for there. 
And here in this animation, we're just showing, you know, there are other issues when you have enzymes in your assay, and there, there's always places where things can go wrong, so we highlight that here. And what basically what we're trying to do with these Plexet assays um, in our encounter assays is just cut right through all those enzymatic steps from and basically get the RNA within this big green arrow I show here, just have a hybridization event, load on instruments simply, and then just get the data from there. Um, I also like to show a few different um, reviews and another paper about qPCR. So again, to highlight what other people point out about qPCR and the issues that sometimes we unfortunately ignore about the complexity of it. So this is actually a pretty good review about that. And, you know, they, I, this is a very, it's a very critical view of RT qPCR. And, you know, you can get a lot of technical noise if you're not careful, basically. And you can go in and see their um, opinions on that and what the consequences are. This one too is very analytical. So this paper here, uh, they went through a lot of um, previously published data from 06 to 13. And what they're doing, they, they had guidelines for validity. So that's the second bullet point below. And, and basically one of the big issues is that a lot of users, and I did this back in the day, quite a lot, like about 10 years ago when I started doing qPCR, is that I would just use a single reference gene. And that was usually 18S or gap DH, which maybe not have been ideal. Um, a lot of times I probably didn't know if that housekeeper was moving around with my different drug treatments I was doing or whatever experiment I was doing in there. So it's it's not great and this group definitely believes it's not ideal just to have a single reference gene. Um, and in general, most people use these really highly expressed um, reference genes, you know, actin, gap DH, and ATS. And very few publications to so the uh, bottom bullet point right there. Um, very few people actually validate the reference genes. They just assume a housekeeper's housekeeper, and that is going to work out for them. So that's this. And what this next table shows, I kind of break it down a little bit, and how Plexa can kind of help out some of these issues is uh, to get through a lot of this, you do a lot of technical replicates um, with qPCR. So with Plexa, you don't need as technical replicates ever really. So I'll show some data for that about the R squared values between replicates. But since it's so high, highly reproducible, we tend to not do technical replicates. We do them in R&D you know, to check the system. But when you're actually doing experiments at the lab, they're not necessary like they are for qPCR. Um, the big one, too, is the controls. We have inbuilt system controls, but then going back to these housekeepers. So we have room for you know 96 different genes. I like to use a lot of that real estate for housekeeping genes. So I put three to six here. I always put at least five to six minimum. For some of our like larger encounter assays, we'll go up to 12, 24, 36 housekeepers, which makes you feel a lot better in the end. You, you trust that data a lot more. And then the assay performance too. It, we don't have any of these enzymatic type of events happening in our assays. And the target design, so I mentioned these Pro-B, Pro-Bs, bioinformatics and anastring designs these. We understand them very, very well. They're highly specific, and you don't have to worry about, you know, designing your own qPCR type of primers. So that's running through the assay. So what I'd like to do is just show a, just a little bit of data with what we actually get when we run this assay. So what I'm going to show here is a set of 96 genes that we use to look at um, some colorectal cancer samples. So one thing we, we'd like to do... Not everybody has 96 genes off the top of their head that they can just throw out and say, I want you to design these. So on our website, we have about 104 different what we're calling pre-selected panels already designed. So these should help you get started in what you want to do. And everything's customizable. So if I'm looking at uh, this lymphocyte activity panel, I'm liking it, but I want to take five things out, put five things in, that's totally possible. So these are usually starting point. I like to use this. So. Um, just to get us started and show some data. So here, this is 96 genes. There are five housekeeping genes at the bottom. Um, we've already had them pre-designed for human, mouse, and rat, but any any species can be customized for this. Um, it's purified, uh, curated by our bioinformatics team. They do this very quickly. We've been doing this for years, so we turn these over very fast. Um, and again, I, I, when we pre-design these, we put at least five in here. You could always do more if you'd like to. And we have some positive and negative controls included in there. So this is just a list of genes that I'm going to show in some colorectal cancer samples. Um, this is one panel that we use to look at some colorectal cancer samples. We went and actually just took two of these panels 
And what we did here is that we, we took 44 uh, colorectal cancer samples and we purified the RNA from those. So 44, and we actually did two technical replicates just so you know we could show the data, how reproducible it was. That, so that ends up being 88 different wells. I mean, to get to 96, we took eight other wells for um, controls that we used there. So it ended up being a full 96 volt plate for this. And what I did here on the left here, the formatting is a little different. It's the same IO lymphocyte activity panel I just showed. Then we also um, ran on this myeloid activity panel on the right here. And in the end, I just like shown this. I'm not going to dig too deep in like what actually happened in the data, what we actually see, what interesting biology there is. What I just want to show is a lot of data in just one run, or actually just one day. So each of these massive key maps right here was just one encounter run. So the top axis is samples going from top to bottom. That axis are the different genes that we actually measured. And the one on the left right here, the IO lymphocyte activity, again, uh, different samples going from left to right. There's a ton of data there. And that was just one encounter run. And then the myeloid activity on the right was another encounter run. So a single user, so um, uh, one of my group members ran this. They can do, just do this in a day if they have all those. So again, idea, don't want to dig too much into, I don't want to dig into the data right now, but just to show a lot of data. It ends up being you know 92, 16 data points you can get per encounter run. And just taken from this data, just to show some reproducibility between technical replicates, what I did, I took three samples from here. So these are just block IDs. That's how we named the different samples we had for these colorectal cancer samples. And in the blue, I'm showing the lymphocyte activity panel. In the green, I'm showing the myeloid activity panel. And I'm showing the um, correlation between the two. So unfortunately, I didn't label my axes here. They went away. These are log two based counts on the left. Um, so next to replicate two and replicate one, it goes zero to 16. Those are log base two counts I'm showing. And again, highly reproducible data when you look at the two technical replicates for these. So the next thing I want to talk about is, so that's the Plex set assay. And what we've done here is that smaller gene sets, I mean, they're still quite large, 96 is a lot of genes. <laughs> so 12 to 96 are the number of targets we typically look at. What we want to do, we can get this data pretty quickly with very little hands-on time. One bottleneck at this point would be if I'm doing a cell line type assays, I don't really want to purify all my RNA for all those samples. So what I what I want to focus on through most of this talk is what we're calling lice and go protocol. So how can we minimize the time of actual sample handling, sample prep, to cut that bottleneck, then throw it right into our plex set assay to get it data even faster. So I like showing this little figure just to get back at that point. So I shouldn't do this before, but what I'm, the only difference here is I'm highlighting the lysate in a little green circle. And, you know, is there an easy way just to throw down all your cells into a 96 well plate, throw something on top of them, let them lyse, take that sample and put it right into a hybridization reaction. So again, we spent a lot of time on that. So one thing we did, we, we went through a lot of different lysis buffers to figure out how to make this possible. And again, in, in r and we spent a lot of time on this, and we looked at a lot of different cell types. So I'm going to go from, on the left all the way down through these different bullet points. So we, we looked at human and pri uh, human and mouse primary cells, um, suspension cell lines and adherent cell lines. And in the end, all these cell lines are very different and behave differently, and you have to lyse them in different ways. So we figured that out. Um, even though they are different, you can usually you can put them in just a few a few buckets, so I'll show data for a lot of these different cell lines, um, you know, to the point where we're very confident that this is working out, probably for all cell lines. Um, cell number input was determined for these. You can do a range of cells um, and get data with really good R squared values. And in the end, it, we ended up going with two buffers for these protocols that we developed. One is a buffer a lot of people are familiar with, which is RLT um, for Kaijin. So you see this in your Kaijin kits all the time <laughs> if, you, if you've been doing molecular biology at all in the lab. And basically what this is, well, lice cells is RLT, which is common for people, but we basically need to dilute it down. So it ends up being a one-third dilution of RLT that we use for these lysates. And the reason we have to do this is it's a nanostring um, specific phenomenon or it's just a hybridization specific phenomenon, where if you add too much of this k-tropic buffer, which is RLT, 
it can basically interfere with our hybridization event. So we had to modify the protocol to fit that to make it work. And then we end up using this for primary cells. So this works quite well for human and mouse primary cells. And then we use the ice grip buffer from BioRad for suspension and adherence cell lines. Um, the goal of all this, which I want to show is that you know, we just want to determine the buffers that are necessary to show complete lysis and make sure it looks correlated well with purified RNA that was run in parallel from the same cell lines. And then we also go through, we're working on identifying um, minimal number of cell used. A lot of that depends on the cell line you're looking at and the gene of interest, if it's a higher low expressor. And then we're also working on more protocols. And you know, one I list here is optimizing sorting protocols that we're working on. So. Yeah, I, I just want to show some very simple graphs just to get this started. I'll show correlations with purified RNA next. But what, what I'm showing here is total count on the left. So I have 96 genes of interest, which very similar to the list I showed previously. I'm looking at that and just seeing all the number of counts I'm getting for my one encounter run. And then cell input is on the bottom too. It's a little squashed for the primary cells graph, but you can maybe, let's just look at the middle graph, focus there for suspension cell lines. So what I'm showing the bottom numbers of cells input into a well, and then I'm just looking at the total counts that I get from it. If I add more cells, I expect more counts. And we see this for all these different cell lines right here. So that's the data, and I'm not showing replicates for those, but if you were to do it multiple times, they replicate really well. One comparison I really like to show is this one, where I actually look at purified RNA and compare that to what I'm calling crude lysate from the left. And again, these are um, log base two counts that I'm showing. These are log base two encounter counts I'm showing. So these are here in suspension cell lines, and these were lysed with dice grip buffer and ran with our protocol that we've developed. And um, we have a melanoma cell line, CCRF, CEM, jerk and hep 2 shown here. And again, bottom axis is purified RNA, and then crude lysates, um, are on that left axis, top down. And again, get very high correlations for all these. So that gives us confidence that we're measuring things very similar as you were to go through and do the entire RNA purification. Next one, one a major interest for a lot of people is human primary cells. So I'm showing uh, unstimmed uh, PBMCs and stimmed PBMCs on top. Again, really great correlation. And you can see the, the graphs shifts kind of up a bit because a lot of genes are being expressed now in the stimulated PBMC condition. We have monocytes and Tregs also showing really nice correlations with purified RNA versus our crude lysates. And finally, we've also done this with mouse primary cells. So mouse bone marrow cells, dendritic Treg, and spleen also works on mouse with a mouse-specific probe set. So we, we went through, did a lot of work on this to dial in the protocols for these, and tested a lot of cell lines, and in the end, we like diluted RLT for primary cells and nice grip buffer we believe works best for a lot of cell lines. And this is a list of some of the cells we've actually looked at for all these. So we covered, this is about almost 20 different cell lines just to survey um, what's going on. And all the protocols look pretty good for all these. So we think it's going to work really well for all the different cell lines out there. So we have this lysate protocol figured out right now. And I mentioned the multiplexing earlier, so now I just want to combine all these two together and show some data for that. So again, I'm going to show this panel one more time. So this is the lymphocyte activity panel that we did. We're actually looking at um, targets of interest in immunology right now. So what we did here in the lab is actually combine the plexite assay with these lysate assays to get really high throughput data quickly. And this is, again, one big key map I'd really like to show here um, of all the data. So we actually, on the right here, we have different cell lines and different cell types listed, primary cells listed on the right. And then these are actually, all these data points are averages of four replicates just to make this heat map at least somewhat viewable to you guys. So what I like to show on the far left, they're annotations with different colors for different numbers of cells plated, different license buffer used, different cell types, primary or cell lines. And what's nice here is you see all these different combinations. So this this you know, kind of summarizes everything I've talked about. It works for different numbers of cells, works for different license buffer, different types of cells. And you can see a nice dynamic range of the different counts here. Um, you can see different cell types clustering as you'd expect to the top part. Um, Top one, two, three, four, five cell lines are actually adherent cell lines. They look more similar than the other cell lines at the bottom. The bottom two, 
targets, say CDA positive donor one, donor two, those are PBMCs or CDA positive PBMCs from two different donors. They look most similar to each other as compared to all the other cells being analyzed. So again, these are primary cells, suspension cells, adherent cells, all work, get nice data out of all of this right here. Um, finally, again, just a little teaser of what kind of data you can actually get from this. All this data makes sense, you know, when you dig in deeper and deeper into it. So we did four replicates for all these. Um, so with that, we can get p-values and look at full changes between different cell types in here. So on the far left, I'm looking at NK cells versus Tregs, and you know, you could you can sit and stare at this slide a bit once it's actually in your hands, and you'll see that. Again, we're seeing the expected patterns. I'm just going to point out, can't see my pointer, but on the NK cells versus Tregs on the left, you see granzyme A and granzyme B way off to the right, high expression in NK. And for the Tregs, I'm seeing my CTLA4, FOXP3, and other targets on the left. So those are higher in the Tregs. Um, the graph on the right, which is the stim PBMCs versus unstim PBMCs, again, you're seeing all the shift in targets as you stimulate the PBMCs. P value shown here. I, I drew a line at two, so that's a P value, and it's a negative one log base 10 scale. So it ends up being, you know, a two is a 0.01 P value. So highly significant C gene shift left and right for there. So again, I, I encourage you to look a little bit closer at that data when you grab this PDF. So finally, so I, what I just want to summarize is that so Plexet, license go. Plexet made the, you know, got through the QPCR type of issues, made that gene analysis part of it much more simple. Lysengo gets through a lot of our, uh, all the issues you have with RNA purification, all the time and effort it takes to do that. So it ends up being a much faster protocol, get a lot more data a lot faster. Um, so, uh, cell life state data cure, uh, uh, correlates well with total purified RNA, which we expect when it's working, and then um, the data demonstrates high, high quality data. So again, this is this is kind of teaser data with cells that we purchased from different commercial suppliers. We did a few stimulation PBMC types of experiments to make sure everything makes sense. But now we're really eager to like try this on more elaborate experimental samples. So we'd like to reach out to others for that and work on collaborations. and. Right now, we're actually in the lab now that we've dialed in these protocols. We're developing these uh, data sets right now with really interesting samples. And then at the very bottom, um, I have the contact information for our project manager, Anisha, who, who works on Flexus. And again, we're looking in other sample types. We have cell lines dialed in. Um, and definitely contact Anisha if you want to work with us. Um, finally, you know, solutions. Kind of repeating what I just had said. So RNA purification not necessary. Can work with low cell numbers and high sample multiplexing very quickly. And the last, you know, com commercial thing we wanted to show you was uh, for a lot of this, since we, we want to engage with the community and get this out there and have people use this a lot easier. When we, to to help with this, we like to put out these different grant programs. And the idea here is from those pre-selected pathway panels I've shown a few here in this a few slides ago. We actually have many of these designed out on our website, and you can just go on our website and look at these different panels we, we've looked at. Um, the idea is you select one of these panels, um, and you could actually test your reagents um, with one of these um, kits to run the encounter of flexed assays. And then, you know, it, the applicants that are chosen by us, you get your free reagents for Plexa 96. You get to run it. Um, and then there's more information there on how to actually um, try that out. So, yeah, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, and hopefully hear from you soon about using these. And that's that is a thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, for your multiplex technology, how do you need to optimize target primers? Okay, so, um, yeah, I got this I got this just a little bit on the on the one slide I showed um, the Probate Pro Bs. So, 
Isotheses are analogous to qPCR primers, where you have a forward and reverse primer reamplification. amplification. We don't really, you, you don't have to, you don't have to do any optimization at all. So our bioinformatics team designs them for you, then you order them. You don't have to do the normal sort of other QC checks you do for qPCR for those to make sure primers don't interact and make sure you know how they implicate, what the actual amplification efficiency is or anything like that. So it ends up being basically um, you know what you've seen with the primers. Thank you. Our next question is, what are the minimum number of genes I can analyze with Plexa? Is multiplexing fewer genes easier? Yeah, so you can, so the 96 is the limit. I'd allude, and I, this can be confusing sometimes because we focus on the 800 plex quite a lot at Nanostream. So just the way plex that works, the max is 96. Um, and all the data I showed was closer to 96. We first launched this with 12 and 24 genes um, about, it was about a year ago when we did that. So we do have different kits to look at 12 genes, 24, 48, 72, and 96 different genes at a time. And you can look at any number of genes in between. If you want to do less than 12, you can. Um, you know, sometimes it's hard to pick 12 genes even of interest if you're hyper-focused on just a few. A lot of times uh, we encourage people to throw in more housekeepers if you need to do that, but it ends up being the same amount of work between 12 and 96 genes. Uh, it's just ordering more oligos and then a company you buy them from will um, Alibot them and formulate them for you in combination. So it ends up being the same amount of work. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is, if I am using these protocols, do I need to convert RNA to DNA? Uh, so no, you do not need to convert. So, you know, early on I mentioned for our standard nanostring technology, you don't need to convert RNA to cDNA because it's just hybridizing our DNA moieties are interacting with RNA directly. So you don't need to make cDNA from these. With the Lysengo protocols, same thing is true. You lyse them, RNA comes out of the cell and the solution is liberated, and then we just hybridize with it directly. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Our last question is, does this work with tissues? So yeah, the tissue, yeah. So I'm, I'm just showing cells here and we're interested in looking at this. So we haven't developed those protocols yet, but we're really eager to start those. So, um, you know, tissues are different than cells. They're intact, they're a little bit harder to lice. Sometimes you have to sonicate those. So we're interested in looking into those. So if, if people did have those samples, uh, we definitely want to uh, check those out with you guys and would definitely want to consider collaborations on that. But have not looked into it yet, but are eager to look into it and develop those protocols. I would like to once again thank Dr. Chris Merritt for his presentation. I would also like to thank NanoString Technologies for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August of 2018. You will receive an email from Labyrinths letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.